Welcome to the podcast, Super Friends. Five podcast producers from across North America get together to discuss podcasting. We're on the air in three, two. Actually, we're live. <laughs> My name is Matt Kundal. I'm the owner of the Sound Off Podcast Network. I'm in uh, Winnipeg, Canada. And, we're on the air in three, two, one. Yeah, we're actually we're we're on right now. I uh, want to welcome everybody to this the the power the Pod Power Roundtable. As uh, want to say hi to uh, Johnny, Johnny hey. Pearson, who's in, in Dallas. How are you? I am fantastic. I am Johnny Podcast, as you can see by my uh, beautiful name card. I'm based in Fort Worth, Texas, right next to Dallas, and I produce podcasts with a specialty in audio and video engineering. And want to welcome Catherine. Hello, everybody. My name is Catherine O'Brien. My company is Branch Out Programs. I produce podcasts for businesses throughout the entire United States, but I'm based here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm here to talk about content and, oh, we just all love podcasts so much. I want to say hi to Jag in Detroit. How are you? Hey, Matt. John Gay, also known as Jag, uh, former radio DJ turned podcaster. I create podcasts to help businesses build their brands, just like everybody here, and I'm excited to be here. All right. And uh, a lot of people know David. Hi, David. How are you? Great. David Yaz here, Boston Podcast Network. Uh, Matt, it's 61 to crisp degrees here in Westwood, Massachusetts, the Pod 617 Studios. Traffic on the expressway is moderate and um, happy to join today and to offer my thoughts. We, of course, produce podcasts here, too, at pod617.com, Boston Podcast Network. In pod, we trust, Matt. Back to you. All right, and thanks a lot for coming up with the uh, with the idea of doing this. What we'd like to do today is go around the table and and share some ideas, uh, you know, about podcasting. I know a lot of people who uh, who have signed up for this and and are peeking in today uh, are looking for ideas on how they're going to um, start a podcast. So we'll start with uh, Johnny. Johnny, somebody comes to you and they say, "I want to start a podcast." What are some of the first things that you tell them? The, before we even start the conversation is you have to like, what's the reason for doing this? And I can't tell you, I, it's become less and less nowadays, but it used to be a lot of, well, I saw Joe Rogan signed a hundred million dollar <laughs> contract with Spotify. So I figure I can bust out a true crime podcast six months in, start rolling in some ad sponsors, which is, is, is a fine uh, goal to have, but you need to have some kind of goal. And I've found with the clients that I work with that having it be tied into your growing your personal brand or somehow tying it into your business, whether it's bringing on people who could potentially be clients that you want to interview. This is how you get your foot in the door. Having some kind of solid goal that you're going to build the show around, that really helps you define your audience. It helps you define what type of guest. If you're even going to do an interview podcast, that's just sort of my frame of reference because that's who I work with mostly. But again, having that one solid goal, having that defined, and then we start to go from there. So, Catherine, would you, uh, would you, is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I think what Johnny was saying is perfect, as well as I often go the next step with my clients and we set a mission statement for the podcast. And it's, you know, it's, it's always great to know what your podcast is. It's even sometimes more important to know what your podcast isn't so that you can start saying no to guests that aren't going to be furthering that goal, or you're saying no to the projects in the podcast or the series in the podcast that really don't fit with what you're trying to achieve. And as we all know, having a mission or something that's clearly stated out from the get-go can really help you keep you on track. David, tell me about taglines and describing your podcast when it comes to taglines. Well, nobody cares about your podcast until they do. That's a mantra here at Pod 617. And so first thing they need to understand is what your podcast is about. So when you come up with an idea for a podcast, you should be able to describe it in certainly in 30 seconds or less. Um, I don't practice what I preach. I have a podcast called The Boston Podcast. And people ask what it's about. I say, I don't know anything. I interview people who are interested. <laughs> <laughs> but when I do use a tagline, it's usually uh, the Boston podcast, the voices, the stories of your city told through the voices of your city. So then you at least you get a quick idea of what the show is about. I have a music podcast called Past Tens, a Top Ten Time Machine. It doesn't really have a tagline, but at the beginning of every show, we say, welcome to Past Tens, a Top Ten Time Machine. It's the podcast where we go back in time and look at the Billboard Top Ten hits on a given week and then talk about what has held up and what hasn't. So I think that it's a mistake made of many podcasters that they they're so excited to have a show and a co-host. And then they, they're sort of like, Hey, welcome to the Jane Rogers show. I'm here with my co-host, Bill, Bill, what's up? 
oh, it's so cold today, isn't it? And then they go on for 12 minutes and you still don't know what the show is about. So that's that's the the benefit of coming up with a tagline, I think. So, John, I saved the best question for, for you. And, and <laughs> David sort of touched on it, like about getting people to care for your podcast. So how do you get people to care for your podcast? Well, first, let me echo what everybody else has been saying. And there's a great analogy that an early radio mentor of mine taught me, which is that doing a radio show or a podcast is like driving a NASCAR. I'm not a NASCAR fan, but the analogy still works. You do all your work in the pit. So when the race Mm. starts, all you've got to do is drive. Mm. Prep your show. Have your uh, outline. It doesn't have to be scripted. You don't want to sound like you're reading. But have bullet points. Know how you're going to get from A to B to C to D and so on and so forth. So that I wanted to make sure we get hit on that because planning out the podcast is so important but it's to your question matt how to get people to care it's just any like any kind of marketing you've got to appeal to an emotion you've got to get somebody's attention whether you're telling a compelling emotional story like a true crime podcast or you're giving somebody valuable information you're or putting somebody on the ground in ukraine to use a topical analogy or providing valuable information about something I, like I work with a lot of financial advisors talking about retirements, talking about what's happening in terms of, you know, our Roth IRA conversions going away, things like that. Provide information or appeal to an emotion to me are the two ways to get somebody to care. So you mentioned planning. And I know a lot of people are thinking planning. What do I have to plan for? My friends say I'm funny and I should have a podcast. <laughs> I know, but but I mean, it looks easy. It's just people talking on microphones. So yeah, we 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 have such great conversations. We should just record this. Everybody tells us you should have a podcast. <laughs> well, now you want one, and it's time to plan one out. So, what exactly are we going to be planning for, Johnny? Well, again, it goes back to your goal, and it's really about finding what the topic of your show is going to be. Because you know, a lot of the problems with the podcast we see now, like you said. Everyone was joking. Oh, we're so funny. We should have a podcast that leads to, oh, it's the anything and everything podcast. So if you're planning around a specific topic or a specific niche that ties into what Jag was saying of getting people to care. If Mm -hmm. I'm a nurse and I'm looking, I'm not looking for an anything and everything podcast. I want to learn more about nursing and the medical world and what's happening in medicine right now or the nursing industry. I'm going to care about something like that. And that's how you're going to plan your content is defining who your listener is going to be, who is that one person, where do they hang out online? What do they like to talk about? That's how you can really plan around what your episode is going to be. And then if you're like a lot of the the podcasts that we work on, again, interview podcasts, it's finding a person that fits within that area of expertise. And then you can kind of flesh it around what they know to talk about, because you don't want to bring somebody on that is an expert in X, but you spend the entire episode talking about something else. You're here to help them kind of flex on their expertise, and that really will help you build out what the content's going to be. Ah, yes, the Anything and Everything podcast. Catherine, why are those ones harder to make successful than, say, one that is more niche? Who is it for? Who is going to be listening to this and and why? If you don't have that bullseye of your listener avatar really you're if you're not for somebody you're for nobody Um, and of course we all have varied interests and maybe our topic we can justify talking to somebody who's not specifically in our niche but really the the show is supposed to be doing something and if you're not really focused in on that you're going to get into the ramble territory very quickly and like you know our jokes are all coming back to we all want to think that we're these dynamic conversationalists or whatever but it's really it does take practice to be able to communicate and get your message across ramble works very very rarely for a very limited few so i would just say that's not you you got to everybody who's hearing our voices right now they have to be talking to somebody about something and let that really be the thing that's guiding your show but isn't that there's like sorry to cut in matt there's that ties in with what jag was talking about is you can't especially with the types of these types of podcasts you can there's a balance between scripting everything out and having some kind of outline so you don't ramble but at a certain point i think that there's you can over prepare and you can then like jag was just saying you start to sound like you're just reading off of a script and a lot of what a lot of the appeal that comes from podcasting is having that friendly voice that familiar voice where it sounds like you're just having a conversation at a coffee shop and the listener is sort of just the the third person at the table listening to this conversation. And it it sort of cheapens the experience when it found seems like it's too overprepared. So that's something to think about too, is finding that line between being too prepared 
and also not rambling and talking about nothing because you've got nothing written down. Well, yeah, but but what you're talking about really is like the sweet spot between the overproduced and the unprepared. I mean, yeah. there is like a, a nice wide bell curve in there. And the, it, there is a difference between having not having your show for somebody, for a specific listener. Um, that doesn't mean when you when you hone in on who you want to be reaching with your podcast, that doesn't mean that you're not going to attract other types of people sure. who aren't that exact person. So it's it really is that like that sweet spot between those two extremes. Yeah. We're Dude. not we're not disagreeing here. No. <laughs> By the way, we will Jag, later. <laughs> Jag keeps moving off this. Did you disappear? Everyone's going to think I'm putting Jag in a corner. Or... <laughs> Nobody puts Jag in a corner. No, I'm ha I'm having a login issue. I will be uh I'll be back momentarily and I'll be good. I just apologize. Right. <laughs> uh, David, tell me a little bit about about show structure because uh, and I think Catherine touched on it a little bit about you know, there could be just some endless ram rambling, but when you talk to clients about, you know, structuring a show, what does that involve? Yeah, I think it's important because picking up on what people have said, you know, informality is great, but rambling is bad. And so most people want to do an interview podcast. I mean, that that's compromises a probably uh, maybe two thirds of all the kind of podcasts we produce is you've got a host and perhaps a co-host and a guest. So what so you start with the simple structure of we're going to ask the guest question. So is that enough? Well, first off, the advice that I think is probably most important to any podcaster is please make sure you listen to your guest because you can have your list of prepared questions, but the real good stuff comes when the guest mentions something that you want to pick up upon. Mm -hmm. The guest will say something like, well, um, you know, I spent five years at IBM and then I spent 20 years at Morgan Stanley. Then there, there was a year I had to take off because of something with my brother, but that's not important as a host. <laughs> <laughs> right there, and you say, "Wait a minute! What? Uh, we got time. This is a podcast. What happened with your brother?" Mm -hmm. So that's my first piece of advice. The other piece of advice of structure is, um, yeah, try don't don't get married to a structure that will exist for the length of the entire podcast. But it's good to try things that give you guideposts. So, for example, with some of uh, my clients, just started one with a employment lawyer um, named Valerie Samuels. Her show structure is basically. Uh, listener mail. So the a listener has, has chimed in with this question. And by the way, if you don't have any on episode one, make one up or have you know, it's an that, old radio trick right yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a white lie. Don't worry. Nobody's going to call you on it. But so, you know, a question of the day that kind of warms her up as the host answer a question. Maybe you let the guest chime in too. Then towards the end of the show, she has something where it's like, you know, 10, 10 rapid fire questions. And I do that with a lot of my shows that there's a lot of different flavors of that, but I think it is good to have guideposts in certain sort of mini segments because for, for one, it gives you, it gives you um, sort of a sense of comfort as the host that we know we're going to do this, this, and this. And also the listener will look if, if you, the last segment that you promised towards the end is a great one. They're going to stick around and listen to the whole episode. They're going to get used to hearing that cool thing at the end. Jag, we've talked a little bit about the first two minutes of a podcast. Mm and how important it is. Why is it so important? Uh, forgive me for popping on and off. I'm good now, but I've, I've, has anybody done the James Bond analogy yet? Have I missed that or no? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this comes from Joel Saul Sihai, who has a podcast called Stacking Benjamins that was originally started here in Michigan. And he said the first two minutes of a podcast is like a James Bond movie. How does a James Bond movie start? It starts with a car going into a lake. It starts with a helicopter chase or somebody hanging off a helicopter. It's some big, fast thing to get your attention right away. And I'm not saying you have to have some massive adrenaline rush in the first two minutes, but you have to have something... It's going to get your listener's attention. And that could even be something as simple as setting the table for what you're going to talk about. It could be a tease. You know, hey, welcome into the show. Today we are going to talk about X, Y, and Z, as opposed to, hey, how's it going? Yeah, like we, Johnny was saying earlier, oh, good, you know, nice weather. Dave was saying earlier, you know, good, uh, good weather today. How's it going? Nobody has time for that. People have a limited attention span. We, the, we've all heard the goldfish analogy. But it's also important to respect your listeners respect their attention span and the time they're committing to you they're committing time to way more than liking a cat video on facebook that takes a fraction of a second but if you are downloading and listening to a podcast you're making that 10 15 30 45 60 whatever it is minute commitment to somebody respect them for committing that time to you and be respectful of their time jag i think there's a wrinkle in 
Was Jack, I think there's was a wrinkle. Fun. There's a wrinkle within that too, because people just starting out in podcasting, none of us, ex- you know, save for Jag and Matt, who come from the radio industry, no one's born a broadcaster. So, what do you take, mean? <laughs> you can take this from. Don't take this that that piece of advice as. You sit down across from your guests, you go, you go, okay, there's no small talk. Once I hit record, we are going, going, going. That makes the the experience more nerve wracking for the both of you. So that's kind of where editing comes into play too. If you need two or three minutes to talk about the weather, just to get yourselves warmed up for the conversation, get that recorded, be really comfortable in front of the mic for those first couple minutes. And you can always take that out and post and jump right to that, that, you know, video or that tease that really pulls in the listener's attention. So there is a wrinkle within that. I like that. So, Catherine, why do I need an audio editor? <laughs> because <laughs> speaking of that uh, James Bond start that we all know, and now anybody who's hearing this will know, is that the quality of your audio matters. You, Of course, you can have good hooks and you can get people interested. But if your sound quality is bad, that's where people are making that connection. If it's poor, then they're going to drop off. So if you have an audio editor, they can work all the magic. You put what you can on the recording and then the audio editor can take it up. And I am amongst some amazing audio editors right here. I was thinking about about radio and how it was all very live and off the cuff. But then I'm also reminded that anything you can record you can make better. So David, when you're doing editing, what exactly are you removing or adding? Yeah, it's a different philosophy from editor to editor, I think. And some of the pure audio real sort of absolutists will try to take out every pause, every um, every repeated word. I think generally you don't want to go that far. You don't want to suck the guts out of a good conversation. Sometimes a, a, a dramatic pause is great. A pause that's there because the, the the guest forgot what they were talking about. Maybe not so great. So I we do we do all use and we compare notes on this. The five of us all the time about uh, software tools. There are great ones, but it, it does take a human touch. So we so I tend to try to take out most of the ums and uhs, particularly if somebody has a a crutch. Unfortunately, and we all do have a crutch that we word that they repeat some people don't realize they're saying it three times in a row you know you know you know you know you know when i first got to dallas texas i didn't know anything about so in other words um clean that up we try to uh, try to look for inconsistencies things that you know moments where people forgot the name of something and it's just kind of as a listener it would be distracting to you to try to take that out and then there there are other tools like uh, Jag introduced us all to this tool, which I don't even know if I should tell people about it, Jag, because it's such a great it's secret. Put us out of business. <laughs> well, here, David, David, I'll, I'll, I'll come, I'll, I'll come, to, I'll, I'll piggyback off your point there, which is My that you love, <laughs> which is that there are AI softwares that will delete ums and uhs, but they w- will not know exactly which ones to take out and not. I mean, if you're on a budget and you're you're kind of doing this, uh, you know, as a hobbyist, maybe. But, you know, the artful um is a panel I remember at a, at a convention we were all at, where if somebody asks a question of a guest, and it's a really good question, and the guest has to think about that answer for a second. Hmm. Uh, let me think about that for a second. That's important to the context of the conversation. You'll want to leave that. If somebody is just saying, I, uh, you know, uh, 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 to David's point, that's just distracting. That can go. I find as a general rule, I probably take out about 80% of the ums and ahs. I leave some in for context. I leave some in if just the way the word came, it's not a clean edit. The rule with editing is if somebody knows there's an edit there, don't make the edit. Some some edits can't be made cleanly. So you might just leave some uh, key, some of those crutch words in in that situation. That's part of the AI thing too, Jag, is it, it does uh, like Descript is the, is, the, is the software we're all dancing around naming. If you guys are <laughs> hobbyist podcasters and you want to look into AI editing tools, Descript is the way to go. But there is a downside to that. If you're someone that's really concerned about cutting out all of your ums, uhs, you knows, those, the AI does a, I would say a B grade job yeah. of removing all of those. However, there's no, the, the edit itself may not be clean in terms of fading out of the previous word or fading out the breath and then fading back into the next word. The AI doesn't do that. It's a really choppy cut. And unless it's a perfect, I'll give you an example sentence. My name is Johnny. Um, 
Peterson and I make podcasts, it'll it'll get that. And that could be a pretty clean edit. But if you have the word um in between two words that are pretty close together, it's going to be a really choppy cut. So if just kind of buyer beware, if you're going to use tools like Descript, you need to re-listen through that audio that's been cut and make sure that that clean that edit is clean. And if you want to learn more about that, you know, connect with any of us offline uh, on Twitter or wherever on social media, and we'll give more context to what's that what that means. I want to I want to chime into something that Jag said, and we talk a lot about the ers and ums because every podcaster or every editor talks about taking those outs. I would say that there's there's something artful about silence too, and mm. we've seen a lot of some of these the AI or some of the editing where it's truncating all of the silence, but silence can really be your friend. Silence can help convey emotion. It can let a point really hit and land it can be show the maybe attention or the conflict that somebody's thinking about when they're before they give an answer so silence is another thing that sometimes can really be helpful to the storytelling aspect of your podcast episode and it's not something you just want to take out for the sake of taking things out Catherine, that's also just good advice as an interviewer i'll give a quick example one of the first podcasts i ever did i interviewed the the first openly gay judge on the Massachusetts appeals court. And he was talking about how growing up and being a, a closeted gay male going through law school, there were just really difficult moments. And he was retelling a story and he paused and I couldn't tell why he paused at first, but then I realized he was tearing up. He was getting emotional. And for once in my life, I listened to the voice inside my head that said, Dave, shut the hell up. Do not, do not interrupt this moment. And he, you know, he, he composed himself and that turned out to be, one of the more compelling moments in there. So some silence could be your friend. And I'd say even when in doubt, let the guest have time because if you decide that pause is too long, you can always take it out later. I think one of the best reasons why you would hire a, a podcast producer. And, and this is my experience is that I listened to it a number of times, but it doesn't come out the same way that, you know, the radio might sound or an audio recording, like, like a, a song sounds the levels are low when I get on the airplane. It doesn't sound the same in my car. And then I asked somebody about it and then up came this word compression. And I have no idea what compression is. And so that's when I immediately went and hired a professional to teach me a little bit about this. Uh, Johnny, why is this important for audio? Compression, I mean, I wasn't trained in like full sale university. A lot of us are self-taught. So I can't give an academic answer to what compression really is, but essentially, when you're a hobbyist podcaster and you're recording, thank you, Jag. When you're a hobbyist <laughs> podcaster and you're recording, the gain level, i.e. the volume of your microphone can be all over the place. And if it's way too high, we need to bring that down because it's just going to puncture the listener's ears. So essentially what we do with compression is basically we're sitting, we're putting a weight on top of that recorded audio and we're pushing it down just a little bit or even a lot if it's way too high. But really, ultimately, the the goal of compression is to make the final audio that we're putting out really comfortable for the listener. Because if we, as the listener, have to struggle through listening to a piece of audio, you're going to last maybe 15 or 20 seconds, even if it's the most compelling conversation you've ever heard. So, yeah, and I didn't want to get too knee deep into the into the audio hoopla on the whole thing. But I, I guess the question is, why do some podcasts sound bad and, and other ones sound better? You know, I mean, I think it's a lot easier to make yeah. a, a bad sounding podcast than it is to make a really good good sounding one yeah and, and it's, for, it is one of the things that sorry johnny it is one of the things that will prompt the listener to turn it off i mean right. think about if you've ever, you ever been on a podcast they welcome the guest on and the guest's level is so low that you can't hear it and it's crackly and then you end up having to adjust your volume knob because the host is so loud and the guest is not so those are those are the kind of things like the get uh, people will accept if someone sounds like a radio call-in guest and the, their voice sounds a little staticky but there's a limit and so we, we all just want to make sure it's a comfortable listen. I think there's a trade off there, which is the worse your audio is, the better the content has to be. And people will be it's a lot. People will be a lot more forgiving of average or C or D audio, but only if the content is an A plus. Um, and, and, and one of the biggest things to David's point is inconsistent volume between the guests. If you've oh. got somebody in a car who has to mess with the volume knob between the guest and the host, and they're going to get their ears blown out when the louder person comes on, you're right. They're not going to last long. I don't care what you're talking about. And they could get in a car accident because they keep looking down at the radio. <laughs> you don't want that on your conscience? Come no, on now. No, no. <laughs> that's not why we started this podcast. <laughs> 
Uh, let's go around just briefly about microphones because I think a lot of people, their first purchase is going to be the microphone or I've got to buy a microphone. What are your quick and fast uh, tips or suggestions for purchasing a microphone? What should we be looking for? I'll sure, go first. Oh. Sure MV7 USB. It's $250. I know it sounds expensive, but get that microphone. It's the USB version of this one. That's all I'll say. Uh, sure is a S H U R E is that right? S H U R E M V seven. If you if that is a little too uh, rich for your blood, the Samsung S A M S O N. The model is Q two U. You can connect uh, by XLR or by USB, and it is about seventy eighty bucks on Amazon. Uh, Johnny's mic is better. The Samsung Q two U will be absolutely just fine. Yeah. There I was in Target. Just strolling along. <laughs> I had my cart. I was looking around and I found myself in the electronics department. And there, sitting before me in this shiny box, ready for an unboxing video, all came clear to me. Why do so many people use the Blue Yeti? Because <laughs> it is oh. available at Target. Mm -hmm. I won't say, I will say what no one else will say here. Don't buy the Blue Yeti. Go ahead and buy one of the bikes that the gentleman here we're talking about. Now, of course, everybody comes back and they say, well, actually, Yeti is not that bad of a mic or whatever. Fine. The problem with the Yeti is that it's very difficult to make, easily to make great sound come out of it. So I'm using right now, I'm using the Audio-Technica 2100. It plugs right into my laptop. That's also, I like it as a choice for a sort of a plug and play durable microphone. If you, but the point I'm trying to make here is, uh, if you whatever microphone you get, you need to learn how to make your mic sound good. The Yeti is difficult because, first of all, it's a side address mic. A lot of people don't know that. It's got a polar pattern switch so that you have to make sure that you're it's picking up the sound that you want it to and not the sound that you don't. It's not pulling in all the sound from the, the room. And it's much easier to get some success going right away with a dynamic microphone that, as Jag and I are pointing out, is under $100. But if you do, if you did end up with the with the Yeti, and I have I have a client or two that are don't rocking updo the Yeti my right dramatic now. story, Johnny. Come on, all that I'm, was a I'm good saying, story. All it's I'm great. saying is that the the power of the internet, there is a ton of information out there on how you can tweak your Blue Yeti to make it passable for podcasting. So just you know, we'll, do some we'll googling. We'll put the Bandrew Scott video. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. The Bandrew yeah. Scott interview. Yeah. Um, it, I think we, uh, go ahead, Jag, and then I'll go. You go. I was going to say, uh, again, we don't, as Matt said, we don't get too deep into the tech aspect of it. But when you're looking at the specs on a microphone to pick out, as Catherine alluded to, there are condenser microphones and there are dynamic microphones. Very simply put, the condenser microphone is built for a studio environment that will pick up everything around you. It'll pick up the traffic outside. It'll pick up your neighbor yelling across the street. A dynamic microphone is designed to pick up more of your voice going into it and less of the background. As you're starting out, especially get a dynamic microphone, not a condenser microphone. Beautiful. And just to the point about the, we have uh, Yetis and snowballs around the pod 617 studios here, but they're kind of off to the side, like kind of like it would be in a museum, you know, just kind of placed there. They're not plugged in. Uh, that one of the big mistakes people make is, is falling for the thing where the, the Yeti or the snowball, one of those, it, it has a setting where you can set it so that it gets everybody in the room. It, it will never work well. Never. It'll, it'll, yeah, yeah. it'll sound like a bunch of people in a room, not like a podcast. So don't do that. The, and I'd be curious to hear if anyone has quick advice. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but about if you have if you have two two co-hosts, you're doing a podcast with a friend, you should have two microphones. The, the the technical aspect of getting both of those into the same feed is actually a little bit more complicated than we would hope. I have a lot of um, people who just actually get on a Zoom call, even if they're in the same office, they go into different rooms. And that works just fine. But there I, are other solutions. Anyone want to chime in? Yeah, I literally just got an episode sent to me this morning of this exact scenario. And they had me jump on Riverside with them to make sure that it was all set up. But basically, the setup was they're in the same room, recording into the same computer, each with a Shure SM7, which is the microphone that I'm using right now and Jag is using as well. Um, and those were plugged into a two-input audio interface which allows you to take an xlr cable and plug that into your computer so they had both of those running into the same box running into the same computer i just had them sit a little bit further away 
and I made sure that their gains were set correctly and that everything was plugged in correctly. I think one of the cables was a little loose, so there's some feedback, but it turned out really well. So it, it can work, uh, but again, you got to have the right equipment, which points to, again, if you have a producer on call that you can just call, text, FaceTime, that's a great resource to have. podcast super friends i said we weren't going to get too much into the weeds but we are here anyway deep in it (laughs) but that but it really speaks to how difficult it is to to make great sounding audio right i mean it's i mean you do have to do all this stuff in order to to get it sound right we didn't even talk about like the noise in the room i see like behind you jack i think you've got some soundproofing so which is which is very helpful and by the way and and by the way quick side note on that uh not as expensive as you would think you can go on amazon and buy these one foot by one foot uh, egg crate type panels um matt's got something a little bit nicer than i do it looks like but there oh yeah there you go they are uh relatively inexpensive you want to put around this was a closet in my basement that i converted to a studio so it's not uh, a twenty thousand dollar recording studio but for a podcast it gets the job done horse blankets work and they look cool. They make you look more like a podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all, I mean, I, I feel like I've changed my stance on this over the years. Of I was really big on like record it in your closet, have all your clothes hanging up in the small closet. And so it kind of dampens the sound. If you can afford a editor and not even an editor, but an audio engineer, they can help clean you up really the basics that you need are to be in a room that is quiet with a few with as minimum number of windows as possible if you don't have to deal with a lot of outdoor noise or people coming in and out of the room i have no soundproofing panel i showed that panel but it's just sitting on the floor it's really you know it you should really be focused on the content of your podcast and having a solid microphone to start if you can afford doing the studio and like sound soundproofing your room that's great, but I feel like I, my my stance on it has changed, and obviously I'm open to being wrong, but I feel like the percentage difference that that makes is not enough to where it needs to be your sole focus. I, I think that you're right, and I think also, too, a couple of things. Audiences have come a long way as well. The, the audiences have a variety of podcasts that they're listening to, and they are used to just different sort of, let's call it tones. Plus, I think that as podcasting has grown in popularity, there's more options for those engineering. So if you get a kind of back to the sweet spot that we were talking about before, Johnny, is that there's two ends of being poor audio quality and there's a wide range of good sounding audio. quality. Yeah, there's a big middle. If there's a big middle. And if you can get your show into that, then you're right. Worrying more about what you're saying, who you're saying it to, those are going to serve you much better. Agreed. So all those in favor of banning the blue Yeti say aye. 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 <laughs> can we make it a felony? <laughs> Misdemeanor. Oh, I'll, give a, uh... I'll say it again. You can learn to, there are ways to make, like we were saying, there are ways to make it sound good uh, you know passable yeah. but it's just you have to know you know thy mic it takes more work and if you're not already like uh, into audio it's weird because if you're into audio engineering and podcasting sound you wouldn't buy it but if you are if you're not and you have bought it you need to have that knowledge to be able to work it correctly so That's it's right. you know you're screwed if you do screwed if you don't the worst thing for a bad product is good marketing boom yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> that's true uh, i want to just pivot slightly to performance how do you know when your podcast is doing well? We'll start with Catherine. Oh gosh, <laughs> why me? <laughs> I think that if one of somebody who has been in podcasting a little bit longer than I have, they really tried to turn my attention early on to the idea of engagement. So if downloads are not going to always tell you what you necessarily want to hear about your show, but engagement will. Are you asking your audience to do something and they do it? That's worth gold. That is marketing gold. That is your podcast is doing what it's supposed to do if your audience is taking the action that you would like them to take. So if you're asking for people to hit you up on social media and ask questions or send you an email or sign up for your email list, any of those things, if they're doing it, that is going to be really so much more to you than, than any download never ever could tell you. 
I just want to point out, by the way, you got through the whole thing and you didn't say download until the very end. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but it, I guess to the to that point, it, it's not necessarily about downloads. It, well, it really shouldn't be because I think that most people, let's just face it, are going to be disappointed if that's their one metric for how they're judging their podcast. There are so many variables that go into it and it can be so inconsistent. If you live and die by the download, oh, why was I up this week? Why was I down this week? You'll drive yourself crazy. I yeah. couldn't agree with more of what Catherine said. Engagement and people interacting with you is so much more of a valuable uh, tool to use to measure. It's the quality of your audience, not necessarily the quantity. And again, that, that ties back to what your goal of your podcast is. Uh, if you can define who your audience is and your goal is to try and make some money off of them, you would rather have 10 people that really want the product that you're selling than 100 people that it's a coin flip whether or not they would even consider buying what you're selling. That's right. David? Just to piggyback on what people have said, the, it's always fun to look at the downloads because each one of us, I think, clicks on with some degree of hope and stars in our eyes thinking <laughs> we're going to be the next big <laughs> podcast star. We, we all sort of have that instinct in us, but... We're, everything people said is true. It's not, no one cares about your podcast until they do. And so when you talk, when people, uh, I tell people I'm into podcasting, they'll sometimes bring up, you know, Joe Rogan or Mark Marin or somebody with a million downloads. And it's like, I'll talk to you about them if you want to, but you know, I'm, I'm just a, a, a consumer of those podcasts, just like you are. What we do is, is much different in producing podcasts. When you're starting from zero listeners, define your audience. I mean, think about if you're uh, a, an attorney or a financial advisor and you want people who are important to you in business who might refer your business or maybe even potential clients to be listening to your show. If you could every week put 200 people in a room and talk to them and talk directly to them and interact with them, wouldn't that be worth it? Wouldn't that be a, a terrific marketing effort? I mean, think of how much that would cost if you actually did it to like buy all the coffee and the bagels and stuff for people to show up every week. But if you have a podcast, that is what the experience is like because podcasting is intimate. And so not, not to mention that just having a guest on your podcast will do you a solid in carrying favor with that guest, perhaps that mm -hmm. guest may become a fan of your show. He may become a fan of your business. And in that regard, you could have zero listeners and it's still worth worthwhile. And the other thing is that you're producing a library that you'll be proud of, we hope, mm -hmm. and will will live forever. And that has value. People will find your podcast years after just through searching for a certain person, they will continue to find your podcast. So those are all great reasons that aren't necessarily big in downloads. Downloads are great, but all this stuff's better. To change the topic here a little bit, I was thinking what Dave was saying about searchability and discovering mm. your podcast. I think something that's worth mentioning to our audience today is the value of YouTube and Google. Now, Apple, Apple and Spotify are by far the biggest two podcast apps. That's where people are listening to podcasts on the app side of things. But we've seen in the last year, and Matt, I know you have some data on this as well, but we've seen in the last year, folks are consuming podcast content on YouTube. Why? Because they're Googling something. And as most of you probably know, Google owns YouTube. How many times have you Googled how to do something and you get a YouTube search result? So if your podcast, even if you're not shooting video for it, even if it's audio only, you can still put that audio on YouTube. There are tools like headliner.app, or you could simply take the static image of your show work and upload the audio, create a video that way. If it's that way, if somebody's Googling for your show um, or Googling a topic related to your show, you want your show to come up in those search results. Make sure that your title of your podcast itself reflects what the show is about. Don't get too cute. Same thing with your individual episode titles and your show notes. Uh, Google can't search audio quite yet, but it can search text. So make sure your show notes are up to date and make sure you're on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube for searchability. Have we confirmed, Jag, that they can like that the show notes like that Google pulls from the show notes directly or in terms of search results? Because I know I, I feel like I'm not saying that you're I'm not saying that you're wrong. I just know that that's a point of contention in the world. It is a point of contention, but I do know that episode title and podcast title and authors are seen by Google. That Got is it. that part okay. is true. 
I, I don't know if I, I don't have any numbers to go with this, but one thing that I've added to all of the show notes that I do is I do have a section that's called mentioned on the show. And I phrase things in questions mm. like this question is answered. On I the love show. that. And just, it, it's just a little blurb, just common questions that would have been answered in the, in the show. Again, I don't have any proof about it yet, but it's a practice that I'm employing. I've noticed it in mine. A lot of the shows that I work on will incorporate the time codes, which I've talked to your guys' yeah. ears off about before. But basically, having each question typed out with the time code in there, I've noticed that the shows that I do that on rank a lot higher hmm. in Google than the shows that don't. Interesting. And Writing I'm, this down. I mean, it makes a lot more sense, too, if you just think about it theoretically. If, if you have an episode and you just write out four or five sentences of, I'm interviewing Jag in Detroit, he's a podcaster, we have a great time, period, versus... <laughs> Me asking him, <laughs> writing out every single question that I asked him, what's the best microphone to have? What DAW are you using to edit your podcast? Where are you hosting your podcast online? Is it Libsyn? Is it Simplecast? Having all of that out there, when people search those terms, will bump you up uh, the page on Google. Yeah, and imagine if you you did such a good job that when someone searches for you know, financial advisor retirement planning detroit if one of the first thing that comes up is a podcast of you mr financial advisor giving some advice to me that's worth its weight in gold and it's better than an article about you it's better than your website coming out they're going to actually listen to you speaking and or a paid consultation call where you'd get the same information right. for 500 bucks an hour right and the, and the and you can completely control the the tone of your voice in a podcast you know people can actually get to know you rather than just you know a paid ad is is it is what it is right so we got to this particular point we've talked about google and the show notes and what goes into all those fields and now we have to talk about why it's important to have a website mm. <laughs> Matt, I feel like Matt, you're, take you're, over. You're, yeah. 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 Matt, you're this is all you, man. This, but the, Matt is the <laughs> website podcast king. I don't think I am actually. I listen, Google is it continues to be a mystery in how it behaves and, and picks things up. Uh, I will say you need a website. It's always good to have your own dot com and, and your own domain. And when you market your podcast, you should always be directing everybody back to your website because it's really your home base on the internet. And the more Google understands that you're in it to podcast and, and what's going on, uh, the better. Each episode should have its own page. Should have, you can set it up in a blog format, for instance, if you're using something like Wix or Squarespace. Um, I, I know there's some services out there like, like PodPage, which I use for my network, which, which divvies it all up nicely. And there's room to put in your, your meta tags and your SEO and all the other Google geeky stuff uh, that's out there. But you, you need to play nice with Google. You need to be friendly with them. Um, understand a little bit about, you know, you know, the tags and having the pod, having the website point to the RSS feed and getting it all to understand that, yes, there's a podcast here. And I see, I think one of the mistakes a lot of people make with their podcast website is they, they say, well, I'm going to add a podcast page. And it's just one page with all the episodes listed straight up and down. And then that's just the one page. Google really doesn't understand that. It doesn't really, it's not going to be able to catalog. Oh, I had, I had Catherine on my podcast because if I have you on my podcast and, and you're all listed on the same page, Google really doesn't understand that. So uh, learn the Google game. It changes all the time. Uh, and I think Google's done a few favors for podcasting. Now that when we type in, um, you know, whether it's the name or a guest, Google saying, Hey, did you know there's a podcast featuring this person here? And I think that's really going to be important for discovery going forward. And to your point, Matt, about the having your own URL for your podcast, we've seen throughout podcasting that for, for a while there, Apple Podcast was having problems and everybody was reporting all these, these issues with Apple Podcasts and the episodes not showing up. And I just thought, oh, and we had just spent all these years saying, find this podcast on Apple Podcast instead of directing it to your own URL, which then you can have links to all the different podcast apps. You can actually have an embed of the episode. People are listening more on browsers. That's a trend. And it's we I think one of the big less sort of Internet lessons that we've gotten from the last few years is don't build your apartment complex on rented land. If you have hmm. you, you need to have your own URL. That's where you can always direct people and they can find the content that you would like them to have. And I think when we talk about website, it's not necessarily the one you have from Libsyn or Simplecast, uh, you know, Art19. They all give you right. a, a website 
it's nice and yes you can connect to all of it but to have your own com gets you really cataloged into google and on that website you should have uh badges an apple badge is good a google podcast badge i think spotify is is immensely popular i'll let jag answer the next question i'm just going to set them up here in just a sec here hmm. um, but i think those those are the three you have up there as well you know you can put an rss feed or, and even amazon now is coming on but uh, Jag, who's bigger? Is it Spotify or Apple? Depends on who you ask. Um, my 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 answer to that is yes. Uh, the, the the bottom line is you've got to be on both, and that's why, to your point, Matt, it is so important to have your own website because if you direct somebody to Apple, well, guess what? Anybody with an Android can't listen to your podcast. If you direct everybody to Spotify. Guess what? Everybody who isn't using Spotify, the app uh, or the website, can't find your podcast. Put them on the website so that there's a player, there's a player right there on your website, and then they can also listen in Apple or uh, Spotify or Google or iHeartRadio or Stitcher or Amazon or wherever they want. Um, for what it's worth, when I have signed a new client up for a podcast, I submit them to seven podcast apps. The seven are um, Apple, Spotify, Google. Tune in, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Amazon Music. I think that's seven. Yep. Is that seven, Johnny? I counted on my fingers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to submit to Pandora, but Pandora takes several months to approve Pandora and may sucks. or may not approve you. And it's not and people aren't listening to podcasts on Pandora. But again, Apple, Spotify are the biggest. Google's probably third. Um, and make sure you're on YouTube as well. And that's really all you need to do, I would suggest, because even after you do that, it will be picked up by other websites and other sources and i don't know if you guys yeah know. no to your point david a lot of a lot of uh podcast apps pull from apple overcast pulls from apple right? yeah exactly yeah. exactly but i think you know it's one of those things where you pay for your host your 15 bucks a month or a simple cast or blueberry or buzzsprout or out 19 or whatever it is but if you if if you uh but to be it's free to be on any of the apps so for the five minutes it takes to submit to an app you know maybe there's somebody that uses that app and wants to listen to your podcast it doesn't hurt what about odyssey I have not had good luck. I, I saw a long, uh, a long process to approve a podcast when I looked at them up, and iHeart has very much improved uh, their process where they're up within sometimes minutes of me submitting a new podcast to them. And so that's a USA only podcast app, by the way. So that's that's why I say, I'm in Canada. So I, I say that with a little tongue in cheek. I, I do want to talk about India. Uh, there's Geo Seven <laughs> and also Ghana. Ghana. Yeah, yeah. Uh, worth it. Uh, you know, the United States has a population of 330 million and India is a billion. A billion, yeah. yeah. Well, it's the same as the United States plus another billion people. Yeah. And it's a there's a fairly large English uh, speaking population there. So especially if you have a podcast where there's celebrity or you have popular people on. People Western, do. Western United States culture is huge, too. I work on a podcast called The Cowboy Perspective. And it's this guy down in West Texas, and he just talks to other cowboys about bull riding, ranching, things like that. And he's huge in India. These guys, these, these Indian people <laughs> love hearing about cowboys. It's so, yeah, I mean, being, you want to, essentially, you want to be everywhere. And it really isn't that difficult to be no. everywhere, YouTube included. I have it a is, new client. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna, it is kind of fun to look at the world map and see all the different countries that that the podcast is being. Although for some of my clients that are like a specific Baton Rouge focused, it's like it doesn't work to say we had 12 downloads in Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> so what, Matt, what you mentioned were you mentioned podcast uh, apps for India because yeah. I, I didn't know about those. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're that maybe. Yeah, um, I'll put it in the uh, I'll put it in the chat. Both of them. I'll just I have a, yeah, what, what are you going to say, Jack? I have a new client I'm developing a podcast with. It's a men's health podcast. He's a urologist. Why wouldn't I put it in India? They have the same health problems we do. Why not? Yes, they have men over there. <laughs> Last I checked, yeah. <laughs> I'd be really pissed off if you didn't put that on, uh, Jack. That would be, uh... Now there's a... There's I get a, that uh, joke, David. I get it. Oh, <laughs> that took me a second, but well played, sir. This is a good opportunity, by the way, to talk about YouTube. I think, I think Johnny or Jag, you just mentioned it a second ago, but it, it does play into Google. So Johnny, do I need a video strategy? What is it? Do I need to be on YouTube? Jag is really great on talking about the audio only and just being on YouTube. And I love how much he hits on that. When I have people consult with me about starting a podcast, I always ask them if they're interested in video. And if they're iffy on it, 
I don't steer them that way. I mm-hmm. say, let's nail down the audio side of things first. Let's just get your podcast rolling. Let's focus a lot on the content and having really high quality audio for your audio only listeners. Because yes, while YouTube is is the biggest media consumption platform in, in the world, um, people are going to listen to your podcast because it's a podcast. So they'll likely be listening to it on podcast platforms. But if you are interested in getting into video, you should absolutely do it. it. You can do it with a very bare bones budget as much as you can just have your iPhone set up recording you and you just line it up in uh, if you're on Apple. I think it's called iMovie um, or there's a premiere or I think premiere is the Adobe product, but you can, or you can pay somebody five bucks just to drop the audio on top of your video and line it up and make sure that your, your mouth connects with the clean audio. It really isn't that difficult, but it does give, a you know, a more professional sense to your podcast. And as you level up and go, you can do the multi-camera setup. You can make it seem more like a really high production show, but I always steer people towards let's nail down the podcast side of things first. And if some if video is something that you're interested in and that you can afford to spend the money on, why not do it? Because that is going to pull somebody in more who's searching and finding you off of YouTube than necessarily a static image. Yeah. If you're doing two separate rounds of edits, one for the audio podcast and one for the video, that's something you probably want to do three years into your journey as a podcaster. I agree with Johnny completely. Video is good. It, it's it's better to be on YouTube than not be on YouTube, but I, I still file it under nice things to have. And you can be on YouTube. Maybe someone said it already, but just with a static image of your podcast logo and the podcast running, that it does serve a purpose because like Jag said, people will find you through the search engine. But to try to produce an entire video podcast it, at pod 617 we we do a lot of pods by zoom or by other platforms and so there's a video recorded we sometimes use little snippets of those as promotions for the pod but rarely do we produce an entire full-scale video podcast that's what i was going to say too i was going to add on to that too david is that even if you just have it recorded it's nice to have because you yeah. can pull those snippets and use those as teasers for social media or something and you can even chop up and post, you know, each 10 minute segment of the pod to YouTube. And because we have the goldfish attention span that our world does, you know, having a shorter clip of your podcast can help it, I guess, not not exactly go viral, but entice people to tune into a six minute segment of a podcast where there is video rather than an hour and 30 minute podcast uh, that someone who has no clue who your content is, they're likely not going to listen to the whole thing. To that point, I would also say that if you can take a 30 or a 60 second clip of the podcast, whether it's, if it's video, great, if it's not video, you can create uh, a little video where the words pop up and it's, mm-hmm. it's a transcription on it. You post that on social, post that video to social as a tease. And then if it's a Facebook or a Twitter post, say, if you want to hear the whole podcast, boom, here's a link to my website. Yep. Make sure you do that, though, because some people forget, and then it drives me crazy. It's like, okay, I just heard an interesting yeah. 30 second snippet of this podcast. Where can I find <laughs> this? <laughs> and, and it's the number one reason why people will forget about your podcast, because it's not easy to share. So make sure it's easy to share. I'm writing that down, David. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about? I have the attention span of a goldfish. <laughs> Making it easy to share. I think I think that's that's a that's a great marketing tip and and something that we don't you know consider a lot when we, when we go out into the, in, into marketing it. So I mean I I don't like to be the person who brings all the bad news to this. But after you finish the podcast, you've really only done about half the work because yeah. now you, gotta, you, gotta, you, you do have to market the whole thing and make it easy for people to share, send the people back to the website and, and whatnot. And I, I really like the tip with the uh, with the video clips that that can be repurposed uh, out into the. Uh, out into social media land. So how much social media and how much marketing, you know, do we need to dedicate into, into this? I think it depends on your, on your bandwidth. It depends on how much you can do. You've really got to have a strategy to say, I have X amount of hours in my week to dedicate this to social media is big. Another tool that if you haven't used it is getting people to sign up for an email distribution list. Because if you are emailing somebody every time you have a new episode come out, you're going right to their inbox versus hoping that Zuckerberg shows them your stuff on Facebook or Instagram, which let's be honest, it's a real crapshoot. So let's, uh, sorry if that tickets us taken down off of Facebook at this point, but it's, uh, he's watching right now and he's like, damn it, Jack. I'm sure he is. Stream up until then. Strike. I'm sure he is. Um, in Facebook jail now, but have a, have, uh, an email campaign if you're able to. There are a lot of platforms that are pretty easy to set up. That's something I'd highly recommend as well. Mm. That's the better question I should have asked. And, and that's what's your favorite marketing tool. And I think to that email is incredibly strong. 
Yeah. Who's got others? Um, um, Jag had it on the list. It's word of mouth. That's the best way to market your podcast is your listeners are your biggest advocate. Your guests that came on the show, their audience is the biggest advocate. So hearing it from someone that you trust, hey, I really enjoy this podcast. I think you'd like it too. That's the best marketing that you can do. And it's free because you have your biggest fans helping you. And so that kind of ties into what your call to action is of your show. You kind of get one chance to ask of one thing of your listener. And it's, hey, if you enjoyed this share it with one person. I I know you know one person that you that you know would like this or at least would give it a try. Just send it to them. That is that so much better than than rate and review because that's cliche. People say that because they hear other podcasters say that and think that's what you're supposed to say. Ratings and reviews are good for social proof, but right. that's it. And if you ego get your, inflation. Exactly. If you want to grow your podcast, you've got to get people to share it by word of mouth. So I want to share one word of mouth tip that I, I just recently, there's a guy, I'm, I was trying to look up his last name. His name is Travis. He's uh, on Instagram at Poddex, Poddex. It's a game that he created. And one of the things he says about word of mouth is a great engagement tool is to ask your audience to think of one person. Think of one person and tell them about the show. And the reason that that's so persuasive is it's very visual because if, as soon as somebody says, think of one person who might benefit from the show, in your mind starts scanning people you know, friends, colleagues, whatever. So that's very visual. And then it's the very simple, tell that person about the show because you think that they would like it. Um, and that's a great word of mouth uh, tip that I have been trying to spread as far and wide as I can go because it makes so much sense. It, it's one thing to say, you know, tell your friends about the show. It's like, hello, I'd like to tell you about a podcast that I've been listening to, as opposed to getting very specific and thinking about a show that you like and the person that you know that would also enjoy that show. So that's a great word of mouth tip. That ties back into everything that we've talked about today, which is you want to make this as easy for them, your listener, to share this with someone that they care about because they're now putting their name on the line of saying, hey, you trust me. You need to trust me to listen to this podcast. It's everywhere. So it's really easy for that person to find that if they're on an Android phone, they can get it on Spotify or Google Podcasts. If they have the Apple phone, they can get it on Apple Podcasts immediately. If they have YouTube, they can find it on YouTube. Also, it has really high quality audio and video production. Now, wow. Oh, this isn't some rinky dink podcast where they're just yelling into their computer for an hour. This is a real show. And right. that's going to make it so much easier for that person, that fan, that listener to share it with somebody else. So you, all of those factors that we've talked about today make it so much easier and you're packaging it up and you just say, now help me spread this to the world. And you, you probably have people that are already prepared and incentivized to share your show because they like your show and people right. like to be part of something like we have the, the music. Oh, look, the logo's going by now past tens, the music <laughs> podcast that I do. We have probably about, you know, 10 to 12 people that, you know, every episode will email in with just funny thoughts, reactions to the prior show. Well, those people, you, those are your ambassadors. You know, those that's your posse. If you call them out on the show, mention them on the show. You know, hey, it was great. Uh, Jeff from Wilmington checked in. He had a question about something. We People dig that. And then, you know, you can send them this episode and say, by the way, we gave you a shout out in this episode. Now, you think that person isn't going to want to share that episode or any episode that you asked them to? So, oh, yeah. yeah. Love it. I want to throw out there to guest on another podcast. Yes. Yeah. It, it, just a great way to extend your audience and your, and your brand out there. Podcast listeners like podcasts. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, any, any how to recommendations on that? Do you literally just find podcasts that you like and say, Hey, I would love to be a guest if you've, if that opportunity arises or, or whatever. No, I just make myself really available for, for people who, who want to do this. In fact, I actually have a part of my website saying, Hey, if you'd like me to guest on your mm. podcast, you can just book me mm. in here and you use a Calendly or I That's use schedule once. And, and one of those things, I mean, marketing is really about making yourself as available as possible. And, and is it, Matt, is it, is it okay to request to be a guest on other people's shows? Because people will find you because you have such a distinct niche and you've had so mm. much, so much success in the radio space and in podcasting. So people want to seek you out. But for someone that wants to grow their podcast, do you recommend cold calling basically? No. Um, and yes, I think you've got to be <laughs> gentle about it and be, listen, some people are forward about it. I happen to be a little bit shy. I'm not going to go anywhere unless I'm, I'm asked to do it. 
Um, and as, as well as podcasters, we all get bombarded with guest invitations and mm. requests all the time now. From I don't. Media. <laughs> I've well, been a guest on one podcast outside of this group, <laughs> and it was really fun. Please, people, have me on. I love to talk. Johnny well, Podcast is available. <laughs> well, if you have someone as a guest on your show, Johnny, I think there maybe you feel a lot more comfortable saying, by the way. That's my problem. I don't have a show. <laughs> Yes, you do. I was on your show. <laughs> yeah, that, that's been in the graveyard for. No, you know, so. all right. Bring it back. It was great, Johnny. I still am planning to have you on my show. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, we're wrapping this up because I know Johnny, you got to do something uh, business like coming up here at the top of the hour. So final words from everyone. I'd say if you're wondering whether or not to start a podcast, the best advice is just do it. Don't aim for perfection in episode one. Once you start doing it, you'll get a taste for it. You'll enjoy it and you'll be proud of it. And that's maybe the best reason to launch a podcast. Jag. I'm going to give you a uh, preview of my podcast this week and say that there's a UC San Diego study that headphone listening sticks more than speaker listening because the headphones are in your ear and right in your brain. That speaks to the power of audio and what can be done with a podcast. Catherine. Did you like this live stream? I invite you to think of one person, one podcaster that you know that would benefit from this show and share this live stream, the recording, share it with them. And that's a way you can help us here. As well. And Johnny. Podcasting is really fun. If you're on the fence about it, even if it's just doing a test recording where you just record and have a conversation with a buddy and you never release it, just try it. It's, it's, it is a really fun thing to do. Agreed. Do it. Thank you, Matt. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Good job, Matt. We'll probably, but Matt, you don't have to quarterback all of these. We can kind of know, trade yeah. around and do uh, have other people moderate. I don't mind. <laughs> I had fun. Thanks, thanks for guys. joining us, everyone. Yeah, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. And pod with trust. Thanks for listening to the podcast Super Friends. For a transcript of the show or to connect with the Super Friends, go to the show notes of this episode or go to soundoff.network. Produced and distributed by the Sound Off Media Company.